tonight is part three of a four-part series discussing the Branch Creek Regenerative Turf System. Now, it's a turf system that's been engineered to build soil, reduce pesticide impacts, put carbon, which is a, a greenhouse gas component, back in the soil where it came from. So that's what our goals are when we're talking about a Branch Creek Regenerative System. Um, let's start tonight by recapping the first two nights briefly, shall we? So with that said, we first started talking about soils. That was our first topic of conversation. It was soil, soil, soils. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to, to in, invite in you how important soil is. And, and so we're really trying to build healthy soils. It's the cornerstone to any regenerative turf system. Uh, if you take a look at this picture over here on the right, uh, we're looking at a soil that's healthy. It's 5% organic matter. It has good water holding capacity. It doesn't have a lot of clay or sand. It, it, it is a good soil structure. But then when we take a look at the picture over here on the left, that, that's unhealthy soil. It's devoid of organic matter, soil microbes. Basically, that's a soil that's on life support. And, and the funny part is when we do a lot of soil testing, we're seeing more of the soil that we have here on the left than we are on the right. And it's no wonder when we're starting off with soil like this that we struggle going to 100% organic program. If we're looking at unhealthy soils, they suffer from a lot of different problems. They suffer from compaction, which means there's no air pockets for roots to grow and develop. Uh, we find out they have a heck of a time infiltrating water. So when it does rain or we get a heavy rain, instead of it being absorbed in, it runs off and causes pollution problems. Also, it doesn't have a really good water holding capacity. So you can have something that is a beautiful green lawn and all of a sudden it gets hot and dry out because it can't hold on the water. We just watch them start to get beat up by heat and drought stress. So when we're talking about a Branch Creek regenerative system, we, we want to be talking about not going 100% pesticide free. I know people think that, you know, we want to go pesticide free and yeah, that's, that's nirvana, that's our end goal. But the reality is we need to slowly wean the lawns off of the pesticide and synthetic fertilizers by improving the soil structure. Um, if we go to that 100% organic program immediately, again, we're gonna struggle and fail. So. We, we use a soil testing system, the Branch Creek Soil Health Score, and that gives us the guidance of which program that you're going to use. If we have soil that is very unhealthy, we're gonna be using more synthetic pesticides. We're gonna be using more synthetic nitrogen sources to nurse it along. But as we increase the soil's health, we find out we can significantly reduce the pesticide load. We can significantly reduce the synthetic nitrogen load and still get the desired results. So last week when we were talking to Carl Cemente, one of the things we talked about, if we're gonna have to use a pesticide, what's the criteria we should follow? And so he gave us a rule of the three E's, which was efficacy, economics, and environmental health. And, and so how do we find the answers to these three E's? Well, in the past, we didn't have a lot of tools, so he shared with us a couple of tools that are out there. The first tool <clears throat> he shared with us was the environmental impact quote, and that was developed by Cornell University. Uh, Cornell decided that they were going to take a bunch of information, lethal dosage value, toxicity to mammals, toxicity to fish, boil all those numbers down and come up with a score. Now, it's not a perfect system, but it's the best system we have right now. And so when they did the EIQ score, they started in agriculture, they dragged it over to golf, and now we're introducing it to the turf and ornamental world. So this is a great example of EIQ right here. <clears throat> this is the calculator you can find online. And I just did a quick sample where we looked at one product. Most of you people here have had grubs in the past and we've used a product like Dilox or Trichlorophon. So this are the, is the numbers that we would have plugged into the calculator, hit that submit button, and this is the score it would have come back with. The EIQ score for Dilox is 163. Now, I want to tell you that the closer to zero the 
less impact on the environment these products have. So with that said, this is a 163.4. If we compared it to other conventional products that are out there, like uh, Arena, Arena does the same thing as Dilox. It's a post-emergent control for grubs, but look at its EIQ score. It's 12.8. So you went from a 163 to a 12.8. And again, closer to zero is better. So just by changing out the products that we're using, we can get the same results that we desire to have less of an impact on the environment. I'm gonna tell you right off the bat, a, a total Branch Creek regenerative system only has an EIQ score of a total of 8.5. So our number is significantly lower than most of the other programs we're gonna look at today. And so we figured out, okay, that's the one of the three E's, that's the environment. How do we figure out efficacy? And so he pointed us out to a great website by the University of Wisconsin. And this website allows us to go on and search whatever we're trying to fix, whatever test problems out there that we're trying to, to solve. And in this instance, I said, okay, turf weeds. I clicked on that, submitted it. It then gave me a list of all the weeds that were out there. And then I clicked on crabgrass, and this is the results it gave me. It shows me right over here from a standpoint of crabgrass that products like pendulum, dimension, barricade or diamine, all work very well on controlling crabgrass because that four that you see is the highest score that you can get. They rate them from four all the way down to one, four being the best efficacy, one being the least efficate. Efficate, I don't know, is that a word? Has the least amount of efficacy out of the product. So when we built the Branch Creek Regenerative System that we'll look at a little bit later on in the presentation, we, we combined the EIQ score, we took the efficacy score, and then we looked at the economic component of what it was gonna cost you, the end user, to build the system so that you could go out there and you could compete every day with the larger companies who are offering lawn care and your price point is not gonna be too far off the mark. So you can give people a healthier, happier lawn that's better for the environment without breaking the piggy bank. Because if it's the greatest thing in the world but people can't afford it, there's no sense in having it. So with that said, I'm gonna move forward right now. I'm gonna be turning this over to Nate Clemmer, who's the CEO of Branch Creek. And he's gonna talk a little bit about the soil health test scores. Nate? All right, thanks, Mike. Well, I wanna, I wanna make sure that we have time to hear from Pete tonight, um, who's, who's an operator, a superintendent at a golf course in New Jersey, who's been who's been doing a lot of things to build soil over his career and doing it before it became something that we talk about. So the Branch Creek Soil Health Test, it needs about, it needs five minutes of explanation. I, I don't want to take that away here tonight, but um, we often talk about it all comes back to the soil. It's soil, it's soil, it's soil. And that's true. But here's the thing. It also just sounds like gobbledygook language because we, we talk about soil like it's this, um, like it's this thing that we all have figured out. The reality is none of us have. Um, the smartest people that I know who are soil scientists start every conversation I have with them by saying we know at best 5% of soil. And so I always say be really, con be really concerned about anyone who seems to promote themselves as knowing everything. Um, and I don't think you're gonna hear that from Pete tonight that he knows everything, but he's had a lot of success on his golf course and building soil. We'll come back and we'll talk about the soil health test in more detail on another call. But you know, we obviously are focusing on the soil and we are learning more about soil. So even when I say that the top soil scientists in the world say they know 5%, those same people three years ago would have said 2%. So we're all very much learning. Um, I think what we do know is that in turf, when we deal with urbanized soils, we're dealing with something totally different um, than what we're used to seeing in say agricultural soils. So um, with that, I'd like to 
you know, if you want me to flip it right to Pete, Mike, or you may flip it back to you so you can introduce him, that's probably the better way to do it. And we'll hit the soil health test maybe next week. Mike, you're muted. Mike, you're muted. I, I, I'm no longer muted. Got it. My wife would love to find that button on me. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, so yeah, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our second panelist, uh, Pete Pedrezi. He is from the Crestmont Country Club in West Orange, New Jersey. Pete, welcome. Yes, hi, Mike. What, what, it's funny what Nate said is, is so, so correct. I mean, I wish I had the uh, magical bullet where I could tell you what I do. What, what I have found over the years is the less I do, the better everything becomes. And, you know, golf courses are totally, di we are totally different than the uh, lawn, lawn care business because we're trying, we're trying to keep the grass from growing. We don't want the grass to grow. So we, we, when I first started out, nitrogen to me was the evil because I don't want the grass growing. We, we want a tighter plant. We want something that grows less. So that's pretty much, you know, where I came up with just less nitrogen and just seems to be the less I have done over the years, the healthier the soils have become. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know the, I mean, I use a Brookside Labs from Ohio. They soil test. And I wish I had the answer. We use molasses. I, I, I'm not sure that did anything, you know, feeding the microbes. So we've, we, you know, I've tried a lot of different stuff, but I wish I had the, yeah. you know, if somebody came out, maybe really analyzed our soils, why does it, you know, why, why does the organic matter, like on my greens, I have 4% organic matter, which is considered high for a green, but it seems to work. And we don't even aerify or anything like that. The soils just seem to be so healthy that growth is my biggest issues is yeah. during the season. I get too yeah. much growth. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to, I'd like to t chime in on a couple of things. One of the things you said, you've used molasses in the past. Molasses, you're right, does feed the biology in the soil. We consider it to be a, a prebiotic because it doesn't matter if, if you have biology, if there's new food to get those, that biology up and running and, and continuing to grow and thrive, it's, you'll just see it dampen off. So I think one of the key things you did originally was you started feeding the soil with molasses. And when you started feeding with molasses, we started to see increase in organic matter because that, that biology started to release sugars that, that allowed more organic matter to gather. You, you hit me with something that stunned me. You said that your greens, you don't aerate, which every golf course superintendent I know aerates the heck out of them. And you have 4% organic matter, which is not, nor that is, that's not something I ever hear about. How do you get away with not aerating? Well, we top dress. I, I use a, uh, not a straight sand. We use a mushroom soil that has organics in it. It's very consistent. And you know what people, you know, when I have the experts come out, they say it works, but you know, they can't say, <laughs> you know, they can't recommend it for other courses. They say well, it's working for you. Why would you ever change it? So you don't have to aerate and, and your greens are bent grass. Is that correct? Yes. They became bent grass over the years by not aerating. You're not and so, the, so they're bent grass, which is a, a very thatchy grass to begin with, similar to what we have with bluegrass where thatch becomes yes. a major issue for us. So you're telling me that basically because you have high, yes. high, High organic matter, would you, would you say that this is a true? Well, I, and I'm not, I'm not putting any nitrogen on them, so I'm not making them thatchy. Mm -hmm. you know, you, 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 I used to get crazy when guys would say they'd go into aerified and they put the nitrogen down so they fill up the holes. I said, why do you, that's like, uh, it doesn't make any sense. Why do you, you don't have, if you don't aerify, you don't have to put the nitrogen down. If you're going to aerify and throw nitrogen down, that's creating the problems that you're trying to fix by aerifying. It was just counterproductive. Mm-hmm. And, and but, even with that, you still would develop some thatch, but my, my best guess is because of the organic matter, you, you've increased the biology in the soil, and it is actually eating the thatch for you to keep it at bay. Yes. Yeah, thatch is not an issue on, on our course at all. Yes, I agree with that, but I don't know the magic bullet, what the percentage, you know, it's just... And, and also, I don't use a lot of insecticides. When I first started at Crestmont, it, everything was mowed down. Now we have a lot more 
native areas. So we created a lot more wildlife, a lot more birds. I don't see any uh, tent caterpillars, gypsy moth, uh, cutworms. I don't see, we don't even have any mosquitoes on our golf course anymore just because there's so much wildlife, so many birds and bats that eat everything. So I don't use very few, I, I hardly ever put insecticides down on the course at all. Absolutely. I haven't seen a... So you've really found a balance with nature because if, if it's not an invasive, Mother Nature has its checks and balances built in. So after aphids are born, we see lady beetle larvae are hatch and they eat as a food source. Birds take care of cut worms. Birds take care of sod web worms. And so you're just kind of seeing that natural balance taking over pretty, the course. Pretty, pretty much. I mean, uh, hyperoidy weevils is a big problem on golf courses. We really don't see much of it. I mean, tent caterpillars used to be on all the trees. I haven't seen that in years. So I, I you know, like I said, I don't, can't say for, I mean, why no mosquitoes? We have six ponds. I go to my house in East Hanover and I can't sit out back. <laughs> and and you, when, you know, it used to, there used to be a lot of mosquitoes on the golf course. So I don't know. It's just, yeah, def, I'm a hundred percent for keeping everything in balance. Mm -hmm. Hey Pete, you know? um, Pete, this is Nate. Um, a lot of times, you know, if superintendents are talking to superintendents, which I'm not sure if we have other superintendents on this call or not, you know, we'll often talk about greens, um, but, you know, greens in many ways are sort of an artificial um, environment to begin with. Like it's not something that's replicated in people's backyards. You know, fairways are often kind of a better representation on a golf course to what a homeowner on a nicely maintained lawn might experience. Um, what has your experience been on your fairways in terms of say chemical usage and water usage maybe compared to other courses nearby? Well, we try to keep it dry. It's, it's becoming harder and harder because that push uh, 10 years ago with keeping everything brown seems to went out the door with the USGA. I'm a little disappointed with that. I mean, it, that's a hard sell in, this, in, our, in New Jersey. You could get away with it a little bit more up in New England. The people, you know, brown is they don't bother them that much. You know, my biggest, I still have dollar spot. I still fight dollar spot. I have the older varieties of bat. But it's dollar spot is still going to be a problem. I mean, if I could ever figure out that one. Uh, and that, that's pre pretty much what I spray for is mostly dollar spot. You know, the uh, Pythium, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Pythium. You, I'm sure you are. Is a big problem on golf courses. It can wipe out a fairway. And by not putting a lot of water and not putting nitrogen down, it, you, I definitely don't have to spray for Pythium. Very, very rare. And that, most guys think I'm nuts by not doing that. Yeah. So that you, I definitely eliminated the, uh, some of the diseases. So it's just dollar mm -hmm. spot is my big one. So, so if, if, you're, if you're seeing less pythium, and if I'm not mistaken, isn't pythium a soil-borne pathogen? Uh, yes. So if it's a soil-borne pathogen and we've got the biology running at, at optimum levels in the soil, it, it, it's been said to me that if you've got good biology in the soil, it'll actually eat the bad fungal pathogens as a food source, which kind of gives you natural disease suppression. And that may be what we're seeing on the course right now. I'm, I'm drawing that inference, but you know, again, I'm not a soils expert, but I have seen reduced disease, especially soil borne pressure on golf courses when they, they increase their organic matter and increase their microorganisms. I, 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 you're probably right there. And I think having organic matter in the greens to me, especially in our teas, because now they're building all teas out of sand. And boy, when they dry out, that the, 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 you almost kill this, the grass almost dies on, on pure sand. Because I think it just mm -hmm. gets too hot. So when there's some organic matter in the soil, the teas that I have organic matter in, I can let them dry out and they recover real quick. But when it's 100% sand, I just think the sand is just too hot and they, the teas just don't recover. Mm -hmm. So it, having organic matter in the greens, I mean, but USGA doesn't recommend it. And I tell you, these guys, it's a nightmare. Yeah, every, everybody I talk to is trying to get rid of it. That, that it's, is, a, it's a tough one because when they build teas out of sand, I tell you, that's 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 bigger nightmare than anything we deal with. You've got to hand water teas. It's ridiculous. So I, I, when I do the teas now, I make sure there's plenty of organic matter and I can't put enough in the teas. 
because I think the organic just keeps the soils a lot cooler. Yeah, well, it, it definitely increases its water holding capacity. Uh, I forget, Nate, do you remember what that number was from the USGA? 1% increase in organic matter added how much more water holding capacity per acre? I don't remember the statistic. I think it was from the NCRS. I don't think it was from the USGA, um, but it was, yeah, it's significant. Um, it's like, yeah, we, we can pull that statistic maybe for next week, but it is significant. And that's why I was curious if Pete, you had seen any reduction in your ability to water on your fairways compared to neighboring courses, um, because you presumably have higher organic matter on your fairways. Um, and I mean, I would, I would say that Nate, cause we, we don't have the, uh, we are restricted to only 3 million a, a month by the uh, DEP. So we don't not, you know, most courses is about 10 million a month is average what they would use on a golf course. So we're about three. So I would say that we're quite a bit below so that, the average course. Yeah, that's a 70% reduction compared to a standard course. Yeah, they say standard is about nine to 10 million is what you would use. Yeah. But that's so you're definitely you know, less. And I think even when we talk about a regenerative turf system, like we talk about everything, we're not saying you're not gonna have to use, we're not saying you're gonna eliminate irrigation. We're not saying you're gonna eliminate pesticides. We're not saying you're gonna eliminate chemical fertilizers, but we're saying you can use less. And I think it stands to reason as you build soil, as you build organic matter, you're gonna reduce your water usage. Um, I just had one question personally for you, Pete. Um, and then Mike, I think there's some other people who had some questions that wrote, wrote in. What, what was sort of like, what was the pivot point or the mirror moment that, that took you down this path of reduced inputs? Because, um, you know, it's not something they, typically teach in schools and continuing education isn't something that is really focused down this path. So I'm guessing it was something personal. I think I was always an experiment. I always experimented with everything. We still, uh, superintendents, I think we experiment every day. I think, I mean, my best friend's the uh, super at Pine Valley. I think he, I think, you know, he's been there 35 years and he's always experimented. I think we never figure it out. And I think he just, you know, you just try different things every year, just so you could have, I mean, as superintendents, I think everybody wants a less of an environmental impact on their course and budgetary reasons. You know, and, uh, you know, I come back to some of my soil tests. I used to put the potassium down, but now just for cost reasons, I uh, cut back on that. And talking to Dr. Rossi, he, he wasn't a big fan of the, even though if you're low on the soil test showed low on potassium, he says he wasn't that necessary. So I tried that. It, it's just, it's for us, it's a cost thing at the end of the day. But it, I mean, the turf is healthy as a horse. It's growing. So, you know, it's, it's what makes this business so great is that you're never going to figure it out. You always experiment until the day I retire, I'll still be experimenting with different, with different materials. Thank you. That, 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 that's some interesting stuff. So I do, I do have a couple questions here. Uh, one was, was from Josiah. He says, uh, has Peter ever got a biological essay of the soil to determine what the fungal to bacterial ratio is? So have, no. have you ever done that? No, I never have done that. Yeah. And, and that's that would be an interesting test to get. Where do you get that test from? <laughs> uh, we, we can we can actually help you out with that. We do have we do have a biological test. I don't think it will. We we look at the the fungal count, but we do look at the bacterial count in the soil, and we can actually determine if, if we have a a a, uh, a depleted bacterial count in the soil that you don't have, you know, phosphorus solubilizers or. Uh, mineralization going on in the soil. But I don't think we're having that problem with your place because it you're not adding nitrogen and it's green. It's obviously got a lot of good biology that's taking nitrogen out of the atmosphere and whatever you're recycling and, and put getting it out of that and doesn't need any supplemental application. Yeah, we, we don't pick up clippings on just the greens. We just pick up the clippings. Fairways, we never do. Obviously, the roughs, you're never picking up clippings. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's just you're just recycling everything pretty much yeah. and it's the and it's the right way to go and and imagine 
Imagine if, if I'm, a, I'm a landscaper and I don't have to pick up clippings, throw it into the back of my truck, then get the truck rained on, and then you get that horrible smell. You know, well, I, I, ne I never understood why guys pick up clippings, <laughs> even leaves. We mulch leaves. We, we, we don't pick up anything. Yeah, and, that, and that's, a, that's actually a really good saucer, source of phosphorus when you mulch the leaves back in as well. Pretty good. It, it, very interesting. Pete, I really want to want to thank you for taking the time to come out and talk with the group. I mean, we just met last week accidentally, and it, it just happened to be that, you know, our paths are, are kind of parallel, and, and learning from somebody who's been doing it for as long as you have is, was always exciting for me. Um, so thank you. I really appreciate that. Well, you're welcome. I'll talk um, to you soon. Yeah, absolutely. If you, if you can hang around for a few minutes, there may be some questions at the end of it. And, and we've gone a little long, Nate, and I was going to jump into breaking down a regenerative turf system, but I think with the reason at no. 730, maybe we no. can push that to next week. Of course I would. What do you think? I, I, I think Jay Archer was raising his hand. Yeah. Oh, I am raising my hand. Oh, you are raising your hand. I am raising my hand. So um, regarding soil testing, what about soil respiration test? So you're talking to Sylvita test where you're looking at if the soil is actually breathing. And that's, that's, actually, that's a great test, but that it does have a little bit of a flaw. It's telling you that there is biology in the soil and it's breathing, but it doesn't tell you if some of that biology that's alive in that soil is what we call indigenous non-essential. And you're saying, well, what does that word mean? Indigenous non-essential means that you may have bacteria or fungi that are in the soil that actually don't do anything to help the turf or the plant material. They're kind of in it for themselves. So anything that they're, they're deriving as food sources, they're using it on their own and the plant never gets hold of it. So a CO2 burst or a Sylvita test used to be the, the industry standard to, to find out if we had biology in the soil. It was a good test, but now we've even evolved past that. And I think next week, Nate may share with you some of the soil testing that we have available to you at Branch Creek. But a good question. So I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get to the questions here on the bottom. So let's hold off on the questions. We're, we're gonna jump and, and just, get the winner of tonight's webinar taken care of right now. And that was for two cases of paleohumic acid, which is a $400 value. And tonight's winner, let's see, is Thomas Habit. Thomas Habit, you, sir, are the winner. And we will get you out two cases of the product. So with that said, Next week, we're gonna jump on a Branch Creek Regenerative Program. I got the slides all set up, but I'm not gonna do it tonight. We'll do it next week. And then we'll talk also about how to market it and how to price it. I, I think one of the things that we see happening all the time in our industry is that people will look at a program that's different and they'll say, oh my goodness, it cost me 15% more. I've got to charge that much more to get my profit back and no, it's, it's just the cost of material difference is what you're going to charge for, and it'll give you an opportunity to sell more programs. Um, so we'll do that all next week. And so let's open it up for questions for everybody. Starting now, if you have a question, please type it either in the, the chat room log, or if you can, you can raise your hand, and Leah will unmute your microphone so we can talk. Let's just get to the last slide. So you have the contact information. Oh, hold on right there. So let's see, Dave Cavella, what is the time frame from when you first started using soil building techniques to when you arrived at self-supporting soil in the environment? I think that question is for you, Pete. What was that again? What was the time frame from when you first started using soil building techniques to when oh, probably self-supporting soil environment uh take you to go there it didn't take that it didn't take as long as it's you know i've been there for 25 years you know i've been probably uh, probably three or four years to be honest it was you know that's 
when I got there, they were using a lot of the fertilizers and I started backing off slowly. And then probably in 15 years, I haven't put any nitrogen on the course at all. You know, some of the miners, magnesium, manganese, mm -hmm. a little bit in the spray tank, potassiums and stuff, just a little bit like that. But for nitrogen, no, nothing. And, and you, I think you may have answered this question a little bit earlier, and this is a question from Barry. It says, have turf diseases been reduced as you've built in more organic matter? Definitely the pythiums. I can't, I wish I could say that about dollar spot. I mean, anthracnose. It's just dollar spot is my biggest one. Uh, I think it's the bane of every golf course, really. Every it, spot it, I go to is dollar spot, dollar spot, dollar spot. Because it's such, you know, the problem with dollar spot, it just lasts so long. It's like an eight month disease where the other ones are short. You know, it's more, it could be a month or so. A dollar spot is just nonstop. Mm -hmm. I've got a question from John Raffini. I wanted to know if, if you're using any U-mates on the course, any type of humic acid? A little bit. I, I was a few years ago, but then again, costs. I, I do a little bit with that stuff. I'm not sure if I'm getting any results out of it, but I, I do try a couple little, a little bit of it. <laughs> uh, this is actually not, not so much a question, but it was a gentleman who typed in the chat log that he uses compost tea that his grandfather recommended for chinch bug and grub control, that he used stinky old cigars chopped up and brewed in water to control grubs. Um, have you ever tried using cigars and stinky water to control grubs? Pete? You know what? They use that for worms on golf courses, I think. You really? So, uh, yeah, I think that's supposed to uh, keep the worms from coming up. Uh, uh, well, well, tip of the cap to John for his grandfather knowing how to uh, make chinch bug and grub control out of stinky old cigars. That's a new one for me. But I, I'm telling you. I'm learning every day. I truly am. So the question is, is, is there, are there any more questions? Here's your chance. I think Mike, Mike if there's not, I'd, I'd like to say a word or two. Oh, absolutely, Barry. Sorry. We, we kind of got down on the ground and started running tonight. Yeah. <laughs> still ran out of time. No, I, ju I just want to thank everyone for joining the webinar and, you know, let you know that uh, TechTerra it is the uh, distributor of Branch Creek products. We'd, we'd be glad to help you out. Um, Mike and I have known each other for decades and we've traveled the same path in, in similar ways. So uh, there's a lot of good work going back and forth between us and between our customers. Absolutely. Thank you, Barry. Uh, we got another question from Dave. Um, Dave wants to know, Pete, is top dressing your most important input? Yes, 100%. And, and so you are using a mushroom compost? It's got, it's got a, soil, a little bit of soil. It's 90% sand, but it's got some mushroom compost in it, which has got a little silt. It's got organic in it. Not, you know, maybe a one and a half percent organics. Mm -hmm. But it's to me that's that's I I done the fairways with it because we the our golf course was just push up green so we wasn't never really built USGA mix so I just kept on top dressing top dressing so I probably got about four inches on my on the greens of just the top dressing. So oh, and you did not incorporate it with aeration. No, you're, I did you're it well at first, dressing. but no, did now I just top dress it because I'm trying to build up the greens for drainage. They were poorly drained. Now, I, the more I top dress it. I mean, before every rain, I'm out there top dressing. So you went from push-up greens to now basically sand greens with a high organic matter. Yeah. Yes. And the fact that I'm putting it down, not dry, just putting it down loose and just keep doing like that, it's not compacted. So you four inches of that over 20 years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'll keep doing that, and the next guy keeps doing that. You have 12 inches in 100 years, and you have a USGA green, or not even, you know, you have a real green. That, 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 that's the long route to get there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, it said, Pete said his top dress mix is 90% sand. Is, is, is that what you said? I yes, it's about 90% sand. 90% sand. But they, 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 it's kiln dried. 
Mm -hmm. So they run it through a kiln dryer and it incorporates all the, the mushroom soil. It, it's got some color to it. It's, it's you know, it's, it's dark. Uh, but to me, that's, that's, the, that's the key. Yep. Well, yeah, and, and, and I'm going to assume that if you get a heavy rain event, it, it, just, it, it just dries out rather quickly and you're not Oh, yeah, anything. yes. And that's usually one of the problems with, with getting organic matter in those sand greens is that it kind of clogs up the porosity, but because you're doing such a high sand count, you're, you're not having any problems at all. No, and our greens don't have the subsurface drainage. And, you know, when you have 100% sand green and you put the organic on top of that, that's creating the problem. I, actually, if you took a profile of my greens, I'm probably 6%. And as I go up, I get a little bit less. So we're heavy on the bottom. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like a strong house that we don't have the... So I don't have that top layer of just organic matter. Mm -hmm. It's consistent throughout. So Josiah just asked the que a question of the night. Is top dressing method viable for residential lawns? And, and, and that's the <laughs> hardest thing. Yeah, it, it's, it's labor intensive. Um, getting the right materials is tough. I do know Josiah, some, some of my customers that are doing top dressing currently and, and, and they're doing it as part of a program, but their customers are are not as responsive as we hope they would be to a program like that. So next week, we're gonna talk about building organic matter in a different way. And as we're never gonna get sand, and, and I don't want 100% sand on residential loans, I don't mind a little bit for infiltration purposes, but as we increase the microorganisms in the soil, they start to increase the tilt of the soil but they also start to start to release sugary polysaccharides that allow organic matter to start to attach to it. So it is a build, it will take a little bit longer, but we've seen by adding biology to the soil that we can increase organic matter on, on an annual basis by up to a half a percent. So that, that's, it's a slower build, but it does work. Uh, and so there's a question from Josiah to everyone. Could aerating help speed up that process? Yes, it can. It'll just be putting that sand a little bit deeper. And, and think about it, to change over something, imagine how much top dressing you're going to have to do. Uh, to, to change it over 10%, a soil profile that's six inches deep, you're, you're going to have to put down at least half an inch of top dressing. And, and that's a lot to incorporate over a larger property. If it's a small Bergen County property in Fairlawn, New Jersey, that's 1,500 square feet, it's not a, not a big job, but go up to Saddle River in Bergen County and, and you've got that three acres, and that's a lot more sand and a lot more top dressing to do. And it, it comes somewhat counterintuitive to the cost point. Could aerating help speed up, not sand, a biological active compost? Yeah, it can incorporate it faster, yes. And we find out a lot of the more active biological composts are, are very light in their nature, if we're not a lot of sand in there. And what happens is in, in those types of composts, they have a better chance for erosion with wind and or rain. So incorporating a, a highly biological active compost that's not sand driven, yeah, aeration would be your better bet to go. But then you have to look at the problem with aeration, Josiah. Every time you plug a hole into the ground, you're actually releasing carbon back into the atmosphere. And one of the goals for a regenerative turf program is to actually reduce the, the, the release of carbon out of the soil and actually actually bring it back in to the soil, using the soil as a sink and, and just having carbon actually through the big exchange be brought out of the atmosphere and then back into the soil where it came from. Good question. Thomas, no questions from you tonight? Nothing. Ugh. 
with that said, guys, oh, wait, we got one more. Is it top dressing my because I have a speed up there saying thank you here. That vibrates and not a plug. Well, you're talking like an aerator, Josiah. Yeah, if you can get it through the tube, yes. If you've got something that'll drop it directly in, if you get an aerator with a seed box on it, or this would be a compost box, then the answer to that question would be yes. It would put it right down into the soil. Good question. With that said, everybody, it is 744. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your night to come and visit with us again. Um, we've got one more webinar next week where we're going to go into a little bit more detail about a Branch Creek regenerative turf system where we kind of show you how all the parts fit together and, and, and the thought process behind it because this is not something we've put together willy-nilly. This was three years of my work to come up with something that would function as it should. Everyone wants green grass that's weed free, but we also want to help the environment. And so that's what the system is going to be for you. And I also look at it as, hey, it's something new and exciting, but it's also what the general public's looking for. So we're going to teach you how to sell it, how to market it. And then we're going to show you the pieces that we have to back up a marketing campaign so you can try to grow your businesses. So that's all going to be next week. I appreciate everyone taking the time. Um, if you didn't vote yet, I think it's too late in Jersey. Sorry to hear that, but uh, we'll see you guys next Thursday. Uh, same time, same back channel. Thank you all.